Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we're going to develop responses to identified fraud risk. So once we identify the fraud, fraud risk, what should we do as auditors? Now, this session is part of fraud auditing. So before we you, you view this session, we talked about fraud auditing, introduction to fraud auditing, the fraud triangle, assessing and documenting risk. What is the corporate governance in regard to uh, when it comes to the company in regards to reducing risk. So in this session, this is session five, we're gonna look at developing responses to identify the fraud risk. So let's go ahead and get started. So what should we do as auditors? So how do we respond to the risk of fraud? Well, when the auditor identified risk of material misstatement due to fraud, the auditor developed responses on three levels. So we're gonna look at these responses and break them down on three under three level the first level is the over, an overall response so how do we response to the whole overall situation well the first thing what we do is we're going to start to assign more experienced personnel more experienced staff members to the audit we might who knows we might even bring a forensics accountant so the first thing is assign more experience or bring in a fraud specialist like a, a cfe certified fraud examiner or maybe if it's something to do with technology, bring something with the certification of CISA, Certified Inf Information System Analyst, depending on what the fraud is. Obviously, we're going to have more supervision and we're going to get senior management and partners involved. Why? Because now there is, there is, we have skin in the game. If, if anything goes wrong, we as auditors, we might be responsible for the situation. So this is what happened when we identified the risk at the at, at a grand level. Overall, this is what we do. Now, also, we're going to have to respond to the risk at the assertion level. Assertion means if there's a problem with the completeness, if there's a problem with the assertion of occurrence, if there's a problem with disclosure, this is on the assertion level. On the assertion level, what we do is we change the nature, timing, and extent of the audit procedures. Simply put, we're going to do more work. We're going to have to select sensitive periods. Why? Because now we are going to be looking at fraud, maybe we're going to be we're going to be looking selecting specific transaction for audit. So timing, extent, and nature of the audit will change. Obviously, it will be expanded. Obviously, it will be expanded. In that sense, it will be changed. Also, what we do is we we're going to start to do audit procedures on a surprise basis. And for suspecting audit, we cannot let the perpetrator know what is our plan and what's going to happen is when you start to conduct audit procedures on a surprise basis it destroyed the perception of opportunity for one thing the uh, the fraud might stop or if it doesn't stop you might be able to catch the fraud so that's how you respond at the assertion level and the third thing you do at the third thing you do at the assertion level is start to review the accounting principle and application what are they using the appropriate accounting principle and, and applications? Are they using correct gap? Are they using correct accounting? What's going on with those accounting principles and application? Because here's how, here's what happens. If a company is committing fraud in one area, I keep repeating this, there's a chance that they're committing fraud in other areas in the company. So what research shows and what experience shows that fraud is not limited to one area, generally speaking, it's not limited to one area. Just by the nature of accounting, Every transaction affects at least two accounts, but that's not only the case. The point is once a company is committing fraud, they will commit fraud in more than one location. It just it becomes the culture of the company. Now also we're gonna respond at a third level, and that's what happened if management is overriding the control? So what happened if we suspect the fraud is taking place at the management overriding the control? Under those circumstances, what we start what we start to need to do is examine journal entries that happens at the end of the year. So examine journal entries and other adjustments, and usually those are will be unusual and large for evidence of possible misstatement due to fraud. A case in point where, where management override control is waste management. Waste management, what they did is they started to reduce their depreciation, expand the life of their asset, uh, remove the salvage value. Uh, I'm sorry, on the contrary, add more salvage value to their asset for assets that doesn't have any salvage value. So how did they accomplish so? At the management level, at the top management level, they were booking journal entries. So what we do is we'll start to look at those journal entries very carefully if we think management is involved in the in the fraud. Man 
involved in a fraud in a sense they're overriding the system. What else do we need to do? We need to start to review or question their estimates for biases. Case in point is again waste management. What did they started to do? They started to extend the life of their asset, of long-term asset. And what happened when you extend the life of the asset from like three to five years? Well, you book now the depreciation over five years. And if you book the depreciation over five years, your depreciation expense goes down. And this is what waste management was starting to do. Just change the life of the asset and book a new journal entry for depreciation to reduce depreciation expense. That's another thing we need to do. What else do we need to do? Evaluate the business reasons for significant or unusual transaction. Now we need to start to question, really question management about unusual transaction. Why are you doing things a certain way? A case in point is Enron. Enron stopped consolidating their subsidiaries. Why? Because they found a loophole and they, they basically, based on that loophole, they did not consolidate debt that's sitting on the subsidiaries. They were hiding debt by not consolidating. So what is the business rationale by, by not consolidating? There was no business rationale, it was fraud. Okay, so we, we will start to question this. So this is the responses on the three level, overall response, response to the assertion level, and response related to management override. Now bear in mind, a fraud could involve all three of them at the same time. For example, management could be involved. The problem is at the assertion level, and it's affecting the overall picture. So it doesn't mean those are exclusive, but what you need to know is, what do you need to do when a fraud is taking place at an assertion level. Just know the, the rules. Now, what else? Now, bear in mind, as you go through, you update, you up, you update your risk assessment process. So throughout the audit, the auditor assessment of risk of material misstatement due to fraud is ongoing throughout the audit. So you don't stop after you do the initial assessment. You might find something when you're conducting the audit, and often this is what happened, fraud is found by mistake. Once again, most fraud is discovered by mistake or by some tip. So you don't, auditors don't find fraud because they're looking for fraud. Basically, in a sense, the fraud finds the auditor. So as you go through the audit and you find you find that there's fraud, you change your you change your strategy. Okay, and you, you update your assessment. Now, what happens if you find that there are too much fraud, or you, you're suspecting fraud, and management you're you're finding out that really management lacks integrity? Guess what? You get out of the engagement. So if too much and or management lacks integrity, just you withdraw. You you you, you say thank you very much. We, we need to associate ourselves from your company. Okay. So what red flags you should be on the lookout for when you are conducting audit and you're suspecting fraud? Here's some red flags that should you know start to kind of make you question what's going on at the company. One is discrepancy in the accounting record. The accounting record is not complete. Something is missing. Or there is conflicting or missing audit evidence. The evidence to support the accounting record, it's either conflicting or just simply not there. It's missing. That's another red flag. Problematic or unusual relationship between the auditors and the management. They're always, the management is always giving the auditor hard time. They're not really answering their questions. They're dragging their feet. They're not really being cooperative. They're not providing evidence. This is also a red flag that fraud could be going on. Red flag, it doesn't mean it is going on, but it could be going on. It's, 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 it's unusual. Results from substantive or final review analytical procedures that indicate previously unrecognized fraud risk. So after you, uh, you are done with the audit, you are doing the final review, and you notice based on an analytical procedures that certain numbers don't make any sense after you conducted the whole audit. That's also a red flag. Again, that's why we do analytical procedures at the end of the audit. This way we look at the overall picture after we have prepared our adjustment. What does it look like? Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Responses to inquiries made throughout the audit that are vague or implaus implausible or that produce evidence that's inconsistent with other information. So when you ask management about information, they are being vague. They're not giving you the full picture. Or the information that they're giving you is conflicting with other evidence. So that's also a red flag that they're hiding something. 
object to meeting audit committee privately. So they don't want you to meet with the audit committee privately. Why? You need to question why not. Remember, the audit committee is that independent party, independent party from management that you can talk to, and the audit committee is supposed to be independent enough to be able to pressure management or to question management. If they're objecting to the auditor meeting with the pri privately with the audit committee because they want to know what's going on, then that's also a red flag. It means they're hiding something. And consistent consistent changes of accounting estimates. They, they, they keep on going back and forth of either overstating, understating, and changing their accounting estimate, their bad debt expense, their warranty expense, their depreciation method, that's a form of estimate. So anything that, that, that's subject to estimation or their um, inventory obsolescence, when, once they keep changing those estimates, you need to question why are they trying to um, smooth the numbers to make the numbers fit a certain picture. So those are all what we call red flags that audit could be going on. It doesn't mean if one or two of them is going on, that means fraud is going on. But now you just have to be on the lookout that fraud could be going on because those are the red flags. And this is basically how the auditor responds. So they basically they look at the red flags and they respond at three different level. The over, overall response, response at the assertion level, and response to related management override. Now in the next session, I'm going to start to be looking at specific account fraud. So the first thing I'm going to look at, which is the most the most uh, popular or the most common method that companies commit fraud is through revenue. Revenue, so the next thing we look at is revenue and account receivable. Then in the following session, I would look maybe at inventory and payable and maybe payroll, bunch those together. But I want to keep revenue and account receivable as a separate recording in terms of fraud risk areas. How do fraud gets committed in, those, in, the, in that area? What techniques? Do the company utilizes when they try to cook their books when it comes to fraud, when it comes to revenue slash account receivable. Because re remember, revenue and account receivable, they go hand in hand. So technically speaking, if you are cooking revenue, by default, you are cooking account receivable. Because when you cook revenue, you have no cash. Therefore, you manage your account receivable. If you have any questions, any comments, by all means, email me or see me in class. And if you're studying for your CPA exam, Always, always, always.